This video is brought to you in part by Atlas VPN. More on them later. Oh, Hans. Those flowers you sent to me, they were beautiful. This is Freaks, a 1932 horror film that really isn't horrifying at all. I've recently been obsessed with everything horror, from Mary Shelley's Abomination to H.P. Lovecraft's Gods Beyond Our Comprehension. There's something about horror that fascinates me. For the longest time, I wasn't sure what it was. I wasn't interested in knowing why I liked the wave of dread stories like Lovecraft's Shadow Over Innsmouth left me in. A story where the narrator travels to the unwelcoming seaport town Innsmouth and encounters a religious cult the esoteric order of Dagon, whose followers worship the sea god Dagon and mate with fish humanoids. Their offspring begin life as humans and slowly transform into fish humanoids themselves and find their way back to the lair of the Deep Ones. Our narrator, in a chase for his life, encounters waves of the disturbing malformed monsters, but the most chilling part of the story is the discovery the narrator is a fish humanoid himself and near the end of the story is filled with an awakened desire to return to the depths of the sea. While plagued with bigotry, I can't help but love this novella, and in the final pages that read like a perverted coming of age story, it got me thinking. What makes something horrifying? Why is Freaks, a film about a traveling circus who band together to fight those who ridicule and exploit them, considered a horror? I want to explore this question as I think its answer will help uncover what to do when the dread of your predicament is unavoidable. I am making this movie in part to expose bigotry as a fake and as a response to Don't Look Up, a cosmic horror to rival anything Lovecraft wrote. First, we have to define the genre and trust me, it'll be interesting. I wouldn't have made this movie otherwise. We'll begin our dissection of the horror genre in 1986 with The Fly, a horror classic where a scientist, Seth Brundle, on the brink of a revolutionary teleportation device becomes genetically mutated with a fly. The viewing after this inciting incident consists of his metamorphosis. The sight of a man morphing into a fly is enough to leave anyone crawling in their own skin. Brundo goes through the stages of grief alongside his seemingly endless modification until finally he comes to acceptance, naming himself Brundlefly. I'm becoming Brundlefly. Shortly before the film's end, we watch as Brundlefly enters the final stage of his transformation and becomes a monster neither human nor fly, but some interstitial, deformed combination of the two. The fly perfectly embodies what Noel Carroll termed art horror. Art horror is a genre that should produce the emotional state coined as art horror, similar to the suspense genre, which refers to films that should produce the emotional state of suspense. Thus, art horror is both a subgenre and an emotional state. The emotional state of art horror is a mix of terror and disgust brought on by the presence of nature-bending monsters. As described by Carol, the monsters that produce the state of art horror are threatening and impure, threatening in part because of their impurity. The monster's impurity stems from their contradictory nature, from their impossibility, from their interstitial position in between the spaces of our reality, something like a brundlefly. Simultaneously a man and a fly, but in reality is neither, and thus, is impure. How to tell whether a monster is an art horror monster or just a normal occurrence in the fictionalized world is based on whether or not they're supposed to dry out the emotional state of art horror. Another key element to the horror genre, how characters within the story respond to the monsters, serving as representations for the emotions hoped to be drawn from the audience. Using the characters on screen as an anchor, we can bring objectivity to a medium that produces subjective emotional responses. For example, in Lord of the Rings, orcs, while monsters, are accepted creatures within the fantasy, contrasted by the aliens in Ridley Scott's Alien, which are a new culturally threatening phenomenon. According to Carol, we are art horrified by some monster, say Brundlefly, if one, we're in some state of abnormal physically felt agitation, cringing, trembling, etc., which two, has been caused by A, the thought that Brundlefly is a possible reality, and through critical analysis of available evidence that B, said Brundlefly has the property of being physically and possibly morally and socially threatening in the ways portrayed in the fiction, and that C, said Brundlefly has the property of being impure. Where three, such thoughts are usually accompanied by the desire to avoid the touch of things like Brundlefly. I substituted Carol's use of Dracula for Brundlefly as this is the basic formula for evaluating art horror. In The Fly, Veronica Quaife, a young journalist on the verge of the world's most important story, that of teleportation, serves as our emotional signifier when she is filled with disgust at the sight of 
Brundle fly. This disgust, this signifier of cultural impurity is key to art horror. The monsters of art horror are characterized as specifically impure and unclean, enough so that even touching the monsters fills us with dread and is often fatal, as is the case with Brundlefly, who only needs to spit to dissolve entire limbs. With a corrosive enzyme, playfully called vomit drop, he regurgitates on his food, it liquefies, and then he sucks it back up. Carol notes that the impurity of art horror's monsters stem from the fact that they are interstitial and cross the boundaries of the deep categories of a cultural conceptual scheme and thus is a threat to common knowledge. Things like the living dead, a merman, or a brundle fly. This is the crucial difference between art horror and what Carol referred to as natural horror. While something like Silence of the Lambs is typically considered horror, it's what Carol referred to as natural horror, something that has formal reality in the Descartes sense. Its idea is instantiated by something that exists. Whereas monsters like Brundlefly are objectively realities, object reality being concepts that exist in thought alone without a commitment to their existence. Serial killers are a very much socially understood phenomenon that wouldn't bring about the specific emotion of art horror. Why would anybody watch a scum show like Videodrome? Yes. David Cronenberg's Videodrome raised a multitude of questions. One of those being, how will we protect ourselves from media, from being consumed by media itself? Yes, content today is advertisements, but you are now the content. You're now watching an advertisement. When we spend the majority of our lives online, why would you do so without protection? Especially when Atlas VPN is offering a massive deal. Using the link below, you can get a three year subscription for only $1.83 a month plus three months extra. The best VPN deal on the market. All this with a 30 day money back guarantee. If you're anything like me and worry about hackers finding their way into your Club Penguin account, then Atlas VPN is a great way to begin to protect your online footprint. On the homepage, you can easily turn on the VPN and decide which country you want the internet to think you're in that day. But my favorite part about Atlas VPN is how easily I can block trackers using their safe browse feature. And check my email for breaches with their data breach monitor service. I actually discovered my email was being used by some website I hadn't used since 2020. Who knew? Atlas VPN knew. That's who. If you want more security on the internet, then I definitely recommend Atlas VPN, especially because you can protect all of your devices. Remember to use that link below to get that three year subscription for only $1.83 a month plus three months extra and help support the channel. Thanks Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Now back to this video. To expose the exciting potential of art horror, we simply have to look at the story forever conjoined to the fly, Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. Here, our story begins with a man turned beetle. Life begins at the end of transformation. One morning, when Gregor Sams awoke from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a horrible vermin. He lay on his armor-like back, and if he lifted his head a little, he could see his brown belly, slightly domed and divided by arches into stiff sections. The bedding was hardly able to cover it and seemed ready to slide off any moment. His many legs, pitifully thin compared to the size of the rest of him, waved about helplessly as he looked. What's happened to me? He thought. Kafka puts us on the other side of Carol's art horror. The way we know we are in fact the disgusting terror is because of everyone else around us. A mother that can't stomach us, a father who violently banishes us, and a sister who will keep us alive only on condition we stay out of her sight. Kafka puts the reader in the all too familiar position of being the blight which plagues a house. Samsa is the monster of Carol's art horror and the world is filled with confusion and disgust by his interstitial presence as a man turned beetle. Upon first reading, I felt this was an allegory for queerness you know, that's the thing about horror. It's always trying to tell you something else. This is why Kafka and the Metamorphosis stand out. Because at this, Kafka is a master. The original 1916 cover features a man recoiling from the world. The man can only be Gregor Samsa. This would lead one to interpret this story as an illusion. 
Samsa merely constructed a reality where he becomes a bug. But in reality, he was only a deluded man. The horror, if we interpret this as such, would come from the fact he encountered something so unbearable. It was easier to face the world as a bug, to fully embody the art horror of his desires, to realize the impurity within himself would be less possible to fulfill than the more practical metamorphosis. Is this then the story of a tortured, unsuccessful writer, a man trapped in the closet, a man who can no longer mentally engage with capitalism, or simply just a man morphed into a beetle? It can be all this and more. Here, we find horror's greatest strength and potential danger. The horror rarely comes from the monster itself, more so from what the monster symbolizes. In this sense, natural horror and art horror don't merit such a significant distinction, but it is through art horror, through this distinction, we can get to what the story really wants to tell us. Carol's art horror is itching at something, something we'd be unwise to miss. Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho is a perfect example of cinema subverting Carol's art horror. Psycho is rife with disturbing violence that at first glance is ordinary, natural horror, until in the climax we discover the murderer was dead the whole time. The film concludes by trying to piece together an understanding of the phenomena of Norman Bates being possessed by his mother. His mother was a clinging, demanding woman. And for years, the two of them lived as if there was no one else in the world. But Bates is possessed nonetheless. Carol called Psycho a tale of terror, leaving this film and others like it out of art horror. Because though eerie and scary achieve their harassing effects by exploring extreme psychological phenomena that are all too human. Others have gone so far as to call it a thriller. It's interesting, possession in the sense of the exorcist or even alien fits perfectly into art horror, but the possession of Psycho stands awkwardly on the edge, existing in between natural horror, thriller, and art horror. If we were to categorize Psycho using the emotions on screen as a guide, then would it not be art horror? The piercing scream echoed at the sight of Norman's not so dead, dead mother. The woman who is living in her son forces Sarah Harkins to recoil in disgust and horrifying surprise. And is Mrs. Bates not The Walking Dead? This would seem to fit nicely into art horror, but no one else on screen is art horrified by the idea of this woman coming back from the dead through her son. In fact, the majority of people, them being men, are quite calm throughout the whole movie. Contrasted by Sarah Hankins, who is frantically searching for her sister. In fact, the only people scared in this film are the women. This is most likely why it can be considered a thriller. If it scares men, you have horror. If it scares women, you have a thrill. Still, Carol is right. Psycho is not art horror, even though upon Sarah's first encounter, she is art horrified by the dead yet living mother. We understand, at least the experts do, the unusual nature of Norman's possession. To classify Psycho as an art horror would be to dehumanize a man suffering from intense mental illness, subsequently relegating him to monsterhood. Despite his crimes, Psycho allows Norman to remain human. What we find in the Nazi propaganda film Yed Suisse is the horrifying potential of cinema. Witt Harland's Yed Suisse is narratively a morbidly interesting piece of propaganda, especially when compared to films like Litany Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. Both films being products of Nazi Germany for the explicit purpose of propaganda are connected. They serve the same ends, to legitimate the Nazi party and communicate to the people the party's immense strength. Triumph of the Will accomplishes this by depicting a military power of great numbers and waves of devoted party members. Triumph of the Will is a positive representation of the Nazi party, the film the Nazis wanted the world to think of when they thought of the party. They wanted the world to regard them as an immensely powerful and united state. In Triumph of the Will, it's the very presence of the Nazis that make the portrayed utopia possible, whereas in Yad Suisse, 
It's the absence of the party, the absence of a great man leading the state that allows the conflict to emerge. A Jew, Swiss Oppenheimer, is here our anti-hero who corrupts the Duke, leverages wealth to take over the town by acquiring control over its roads, exploiting the people in the process, while planning to turn the town into a Jewish haven. His plan is ultimately foiled and he is forced to answer for his crimes. It should come as no surprise this film is infused with vitriolic anti-Semitism. The film ends with Oppenheimer executed while the music swells in triumph. Quite the sickening sight. The fact this propaganda was successful at inciting anti-Semitic violence and aided the Nazis' attempts to justify the Holocaust just makes this film that much more disturbing. This is a realization of the darkest potential within art horror. Yed Suisse is art horror, both the genre and the emotion signifying it at play. While typically considered a drama, I'd argue that this film is art horror in its rawest form, akin to films such as Don Ziegel's Invasion of the Body Snatchers. A moment's sleep and the girl I loved was an inhuman enemy bent on my destruction. That moment's sleep was death to Becky's soul, just as it had been for Jack and Teddy and Dan Kaufman and all the rest. Their bodies were now hosts, harboring an alien form of life, a cosmic form, which to survive must take over every human man. The monsters here, according to the Nazis, are the Jews. Not Jewish people, but the Nazis' mythological construction. And only murder could free the people from Oppenheimer's treachery. The film's intended message is unmissable. Without the Nazi party, you too will fall prey to Jewish treachery. A necessary part of art horror is a denaturalization of the subject, which gets its impurity and disgust from its unnatural interstitial effect, which violates cultural taboos. And in Jed Suisse, we watch as Oppenheimer is stripped of his humanity and subsumed in art horror monstrosity. It's fascinating in a perverse way how a film can conjure art horror when its premise isn't horrifying in the slightest. Todd Browning's 1932 career-ending Freaks is a story of a traveling French circus. The main conflict is a man with dwarfism being exploited by an attractive acrobat, Cleopatra. The movie's poster boldly asks the question, can a full-grown woman truly love a... Freaks interests me because of its miscategorization into the horror genre. This miscategorization tells us more about society than it does about the film. The film itself is a rather exciting drama that humanizes its cast of outcasts. You see them play, do laundry, everything other than perform for an audience itching to flinch at their disabilities. Many have questioned its place in the horror genre and noticed the film itself is very anti-eugenics in its embrace of the so-called freaks and its disavowal of the able beauties that uh, terrorize them. It's one of my favorite films, the way the performers reclaimed the label Freaks and found genuine community with one another was brilliant. Freaks doesn't tell us much without the context of the ableist society that rejected it. The film was banned from the UK for 31 years and pulled from theaters all across America. The studio ordered massive cuts and not to mention it could only be marketed as a horror. And even as a horror, people couldn't stomach the film. While this is a feature far from being an art horror, that is the emotion it conjured in its audience, despite a decent effort from the film after massive cuts to humanize people that society relegated to the class freaks. It couldn't escape the reality of the world's ableist bigotry. In the reaction to this film, we find the same dehumanizing, denaturalizing element crucial to art horror, the one also at play in Yed Suisse. This is what fascinates me about art horror, its reactionary potential. Art horror's distinction between formal and objective reality is crucial here. The monsters of art horror and their threatening presence are imaginary, only real in the context of the fiction, but they can still horrify us. They uh, art horrify us. Uh, as the monsters of art horror have no formal reality, the same is true of the anti-Semitic construction of the Jew, the racist construction of the blacks, and the transphobic image of trans people, and so on and so on. What do I mean by this? 
Here, it's crucial to be very specific, to reject the framing, to reject the framing of the question whether it's about blacks, Jews, and so on. It's not enough to say blacks aren't more violent or Jews didn't exploit Germans, as stated by Zizek in The Sublime Object of Ideology. The proper answer to anti-Semitism is therefore not Jews are really not like that, but the anti-Semitic idea of Jew has nothing to do with Jews. The ideological figure of a Jew is a way to stitch up the inconsistency of our own ideological system. It's a case that even if the anti-Semite is right, of course, they're not. But even if they were, they'd still be wrong, as Zizek illustrates here. Let's take what Nazis claimed about the Jews. I think we should have to go to the end here and claim, even if, okay, not all, I wouldn't go so far, but even if some of what they claimed was true, nonetheless, anti-Semitism was totally, totally a lie, a fake. Why? I think that that's my general point, that the moment you even think about endorsing, accepting discussion at this level, like, for example, let's say, I don't know, I'm a I'm an Nazi, you are an honest liberal, and I say, Jews seduce our young girls, Jews exploit us, and I say this. You say, no, this is a lie. Then comes a naive university neutral idiot and says, oh, it's difficult, let's take an objective look at it. You send your soul to the devil in do this. Because let's be clear, the result will be unambiguous. Yes, the Nazis exaggerated it, but not quite. Because wait a minute, now you say something horrible. Many Jews were also rich in Germany. So yes, they definitely exploited Germans. On the other hand, I hope so, it's normal. I think that some Jews definitely probably were seducing German girls, why not? You know what I mean? Why is this false? Because the true, how uh, you put it, uh, the Nazis here, even if it were to be true, but it wasn't, of course, they lied in the guise of truth. Because the true question is not, is it true what they are claiming about the Jews? The true question is why, in order to sustain their, their politics, they need this fantasy of the Jew. Through art horror, we can grasp an understanding of bigotry as the fake that it is. Art horror, the language of fear of the impure and unclean monsters that violate cultural norms is incredibly effective propaganda. In the fly, Seth Brundle, at his own expense, made a discovery arguably more revolutionary than Einstein's theory of relativity, not only through inventing teleportation, but by merging man and fly on a genetic level. In the world of the fiction, this wasn't a violation of nature, such as impossible, but an expansion of what was possible within it. Since the Enlightenment, the progress of science has been exciting and chased after bringing humans to the moon as well as bringing us closer to utter annihilation. It's quite a worrisome predicament with progress as a concept being politicized. And so we, we signed a bill called uh, Parents' Rights in Education, which said, you know, we are not gonna be injecting things like gender ideology into our elementary schools. We're not going to be this is Governor of Florida Ron DeSantis reminding the people of his accomplishments in passing the Parental Rights and Education Bill, better known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. I should mention this is current events and being current, anything and everything is subject to whatever change the future holds as well as further analysis. But I think we can find value by assessing the ways a prominent politician and a broader political party are communicating to their uh, voter base. I think looking at what legislation they're advocating for will be just as valuable. This is from the bill itself. Excuse the long quote, but it's not often nowadays. A law so obviously calls for systematic uh, discrimination. The district school board acting as a board shall exercise all powers and perform all duties listed below. The third duty states, quote, classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. The bill goes on to outline what happens when a school fails to address a parent's concern. Quote, if a concern is not resolved by the school district, a parent may, too, bring action against the school district to obtain a declaratory judgment that the school district procedure or practice violates this paragraph and seek injunctive relief. A court may award damages and shall award reasonable attorney fees and court costs to a parent who receives declaratory or injunctive relief. Okay, what does this mean? 
uh, classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity is not allowed at all until fourth grade. And from there, it's about whether or not the material is age appropriate, which is purely a subjective measurement made by each individual parent. Uh, is using non-gendered pronouns like they're them allowed uh, up to the parent? Is a picture book about two gay penguins starting a family allowed uh, up to the parents? Is it allowed for a teacher to be openly gay, trans, or non-binary? Well, according to the bill, that's up to the parents. Similar bills are being proposed in Hawaii, Indiana, and other states as well. The reason for this government overreach is based on a fake, on a manufactured art horror directed at the queer community and specifically trans individuals. DeSantis stands on stage promising to protect children from gender ideology, framing trans people as predators hoping to indoctrinate children. Today we're watching a political party lie in the guise of truth. It's true. Is it not? We do want to dismantle traditional gender roles. We do want to confront their so-called gender ideology. Why not? Why can't people express themselves the way that they want to? Why is it necessary for society to be constructed and organized in such a rigid binary? And why is it necessary to their politics that gender be a rigid binary? Uh, this is genuinely concerning, especially because there is no search for truth, no want for understanding, just a play for political power. The people in this crowd cheering for their pseudo savior are effectively art horrified by a fiction that only exists in their imagination. Most decrying gender ideology have no understanding of the trans experience and the ways everyone, not just trans people, perform gender roles. It's concerning that education is no longer being taught objectively or at the least attempting to claim to be objective. Uh, the education system has funnily enough been biased toward America, downplaying the genocide against Native Americans, skipping over the systematic oppression of Chinese immigrants, erasing Latinos from American history, and skimming over African American history. Uh, slavery, Martin Luther King, February's over. All right, let's pack it up, let's move on. Uh, as well as avoiding the struggles of the labor movement. I mean, my God, if anyone should be complaining about the education system, it should be, it should be me, quite honestly. But even more concerning is that this battle over education is successfully segregating queerness out of the public sphere. This anti-intellectualism and forcible removal from public discourse is foundational to maintaining art horror, to creating or strengthening cultural taboos. Education and interaction, of course, being a crucial aspect in traversing through art horror, effectively progressing and widening the cultural norms. What are you to do when you're the one they're art horrified of? Kafka's story was one of powerlessness. Samsa was an individual who suffered just for being who he was and could do nothing to change his material conditions except, depending on your interpretation, escape into a fantasy. It's what makes it so applicable to so many today. Whether a worker, a person with disabilities, a racial minority, a queer person, or someone worried about climate change. Uh, this feeling of hopelessness, overwhelming hopelessness, is all too familiar. Oh, actually, uh, I'm not involved. We're actually, we're actually filming something right now. Oh. Uh, how does one fit into a world that won't accept them? What are you to do when you're the one they're art horrified of? Dan Gildark's underappreciated Cthulhu poses this question twice. Cthulhu is a 2007 film adapted from Lovecraft's story, The Shadow Over Innsmouth. The film deviates from the source material almost immediately with Russell, our lead, waking to the news that his mother is dead. 
We watch as he travels back to his childhood town, Rivermouth, and through his childhood memories of being ostracized from the town for his sexuality, as he is a gay man. The film did many things that interest me on this little road trip where it begins to capture the perverted coming of age essence laid into the source material, as well as sprinkle in information of the current ecological crisis, pulling in the allegorical elements from much of Lovecraft's work. Cool weather in the west is the envy of folks on the rest of the continent where only tropical storms have provided relief from three weeks of temperatures in the upper 90s. This adaptation feels, for me, to be the most interesting Lovecraft adaptation I've seen in cinema. It's not my favorite film, nor particularly riveting, but much of Lovecraft's story isn't particularly enjoyable for the majority of it either. It's not until the final reveal that the story becomes a personal favorite, and all the dialogue and racism I had to suffer through becomes worth it. Yes, the chase scene is riveting, and the art horrifying monsters are fantastically unnerving, but the story doesn't become a, a must read until the final pages as you soak in the awakening of the dormant truth. The way art horror is presented then subverted is surprisingly clever considering the story came from <laughs> a bigot. What I love about Lovecraftian horror and broadly the philosophy of cosmicism he fathered is it's not so much that life in itself is meaningless but that we are helpless to impact the universe and live only by its grace or rather its indifference. It utilizes art horror but it moves beyond it at the same time and finds a home more comfortably with what Carroll himself coined art dread. The classification for such tales of dread where Carroll states the uncanny event which tops off such stories causes a sense of unease and awe, perhaps of momentary anxiety and foreboding. I would say this is why Lovecraft is unadaptable. Even when one can capture the art horror of Lovecraft, it seems they can't capture the all-encompassing dread his stories leave with the reader. This is where I think Gildark's adaptation excels. The film was able to strip back the story and find the core of Lovecraft and bring it to the forefront. Authors like New York Times best-selling N.K. Jemisin have noted Lovecraft's bigotry as unavoidable, and it is, as it's foundational to his work. And yet, there is something there to be reclaimed, as Jemisin did in The City We Became, or what was done in Cthulhu. The Shadow Over Innsmouth, if adapted faithfully, would be quite the dull experience and would be plagued with Lovecraft's bigotry. Here, the film shreds this element of Lovecraft and turns it on its head, featuring a gay man as its lead. The discomfort emitting from the town at first just feels like homophobic bigotry. This conveys the feeling of the source material without needing to make the town folk obvious fish humanoids. In fact, unlike the Stuart Gordon adaptation, Dagon, which is arguably the more exciting film, Cthulhu provides an eerie Lovecraftian experience not rooted in art horror. Even the poor acting of some people in the town adds to the element of uncertain weirdness and makes sense as part of the narrative. The budget limitations of the film, I think, force this, as even the monsters while there are used sparingly to the point they could be imaginary. It all builds a sort of surreal daze of conflicted paranoia. Is Russell losing his grip? Or is there really something in the water? Another film whose monster creates a blanket of fear instead of a sharp jab, Jaws, Steven Spielberg's masterpiece. While far from a cosmic horror, it does manage to create a sense of powerless, paranoia for the people of the town. This is one film I was terrified of before I even watched it. I wouldn't go into the deep end in swimming pools because I was positive a shark was hiding in the deep end. Jaws has been the subject of speculation since its release. Castro stating it's an anti-capitalist masterpiece, feminists claiming it affirms hatred for women. Others say it's obviously an allegory for Watergate. Zizek pointing out the shark is in fact the externalized representation of the internal antagonism built into the fabric of society. All understandings of the film are interesting, but I think by trying to uncover a deeper meaning, we miss what the film is trying to say. Yes, it's true, the film starts by murdering a young woman for getting naked on the beach. And yes, the town is not spurred into action, unwilling to risk profits over the life of a girl they view as spoiled the blood in the water, a representation of her impurity. 
Here, I would say this was intentional, something provocative to make a point. Of course, I'm killing the author. Okay, a girl is dead, no one does a thing, business as usual. Our hero, Officer Brody, quite sure of the true nature of the attack on the girl, watches as families enter the shark-infested waters, keeping only his family on land. This is where the shark strikes again, only this time it's a boy and there is no denying the nature of the attack. Now, business as usual, the profitable summer months are threatened. The shark presents an economic crisis for the town and finally, the mayor rushes to solve it, offering a cash prize to the person who slays the shark. A girl and a boy are dead, but still, the real crisis is purely economic. What's good for business? The pressure to ensure profits leads the mayor to opening the beaches again without verifying the right shark is dead. And predictably, another person dies, a man. This time, the problem transcends profits and becomes one of reputation and morality. Only after a man dies is the problem properly addressed. This goes against the fantasy presented in films such as the Titanic, where women and children must be rescued first and the men who escape are clever cowards. Here the film is in on the misogyny and is in fact critiquing society itself. Jaws provides a clear mirror. Women and children are the first to go, the ones most at risk. I don't mean to justify the misogyny or the way the, butyl, the brutal killing of the girl resonates with the audience, only to acknowledge our society today is as bad as the one portrayed in the fiction. It also recognizes our hero, Chief Martin Brody, is no hero at all, only an obedient lapdog of the law. Yeah, he comes face to face with the shark in a raw display of animalistic masculinity, man against beast, but it's meaningless. His impotence has left three dead already. This moment is not one of redemption, instead a plea for forgiveness. The film does water itself down and presents itself as an adventure thriller with a nail-biting climax, as if uncomfortable with its own premise. But if we take Jaws literally, its horror stems from capitalism's inability to adequately respond to ecological crisis. Is this not the real horror of Jaws? The idea that perfectly good boats will stay docked on shore, collecting dust, while the profitable summer months just run on by. I think that was good. <laughs> no, this place is actually cool. I mean, it's, it's quite uncomfortable, right? The idea that, anyway, cut. I am going to make a statement, presidential statement to the American people. I'm, we're not gonna tell the press about it ahead of time because that way it'll have the appearance of a breaking emergency sort of. Oh my God! <laughs> We interrupt this broadcast of Jackpot Fiance for an emergency message from the President of the United States. Oh, we're, we're live right now? All right, bet. Hello, America. I think Truly Don't Look Up is a horror disguised as a satirical comedy. Similarly, Get Out, a comedy dressed up like a horror film. The terror was the wealthy white family and the odd passive black folks symptoms of their evil. Me and the homies were dying in the theater. I like to imagine Dr. Umar was in the writer's room. It only takes a little bit of white brainwashing to activate. <laughs> the two genres are both quite good at disarming their audience and getting to the root of society. Here, I don't mean to be provocative by asking you to bend genres, but is Adam McKay's Don't Look Up not a cosmic horror? Scientists discover an otherworldly force, which means the inevitable death of every single being in existence. The final dramatic moments before impact is where the real unavoidable dread of their predicament settles in. They discovered the threat, warned the nations of the world, and yet no one did anything. It's not surprising that this film is meant to represent our current ecological crisis. I've been going back and forth on this film where at first I thought it fell into the trap of capitalist realism. You know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. With capitalism now functioning more like a religious ideology that people accept dogmatically. The ideological inconsistencies of it are now subsumed into the natural order and all the resulting injustices are just the way it is. It's a very insidious way to preserve an acceptance of austerity, dramatic economic inequality, and to ensure that when faced with potential social reforms, 
private ownership of the means of production remains unchallenged. The late Mark Fisher in Capitalist Realism Is There No Alternative describes capitalism as a zombie maker, a parasite converting the flesh of the living into dead labor. It's quite like the cosmic horror present in the Halo games, where in the original trilogy, you are an augmented superhuman soldier, an emotionless shell protecting humanity from a fanatical religious alien faction known as the Covenant, who's trying to bring about ultimate destruction. In the process of an attempted rescue mission, you retrace the steps of missing UNSC troopers through an irregular environment, a place that feels almost like a ghost town. A marine you do find is irrationally ranting and shoots at you without question, unable to remember even the famous hero of humanity. Stay back, you're not turning me into one of those things! I'll blow your brains out! Get away from me! It's when you play a recording left behind by the Marines you're looking for, you uncover the cosmic horror behind the missing troops and frightened Covenant, the Flood, a decayed, parasitic alien which devours the life of every being in the universe. In your struggle out of the facility, you fight former Covenant and UNSC Marines alike, the Flood indiscriminately consuming, then converting that which stood against it. Much like how even anti-capitalist media is consumed and converted into commodities. Or the inverse, how Amazon, one of the worst offenders and ecological damages, is committing to climate pledge friendly products. Introducing Climate Pledge Friendly, Amazon's new way to easily discover more sustainable products. Approved by one of the 43 external certifications, including governmental agencies, nonprofits, and independent laboratories to help them distinguish more sustainable products. I could show you all the products that have the badge, like Tide Pods or the K-Cup compatible teas and coffees that are unnecessarily more wasteful by design and walk you through them undercounting their carbon footprint. But you know this. Google how to get the climate friendly badge and my Amazon guy will tell you how to navigate the system and that the whole thing is a marketing gimmick. Through a third party uh, sustainability certification, there's multiple different certifications that are out there. And there's another page that I will share in a moment on where you can find those and what certifications your product might be eligible for. Additionally, Amazon has created their own certification called Compact by design but in a desperate way the climate friendly badge you know the they know it's a far shit they're doing it anyway is reason to hope what fisher did in his book was mainly offer two ways to break through capitalist realism education and bureaucracy he highlights climate change as a contested zone already a site where politicization is being fought for Fisher is definitely right, but I think climate change is a key issue to hold firm on. The sign of any environmental advocacy being pointless is when people know the greenwashing is a facade and when corporations no longer do it, when they no longer try to pretend to be part of the solution. This is where me and Don't Look Up differ tremendously. In the film, all hope was lost before they even discovered the asteroid. However, it's rather interesting in the way it critiques the current approach to climate change advocacy. You must believe the scientists, you must read the research, and so on. Of course, the science obviously shows a human-produced threat to global ecology. This is from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. But as time has shown by the continued struggle to push for meaningful action to address the issue, and as Matthew T. Herbert pointed out in Climate Change as Class War, climate politics rooted in knowledge has limitations. Don't look up to pixel world where climate change rooted in science alone was not enough to get the world to listen. Our protagonist scientist, Dr. Randall Mindy, the one who plots out the path of the asteroid along with PhD student Kate DiBiaschi, who the asteroid is named after, begin the film advocating that the government takes drastic action to stop the asteroid. So how certain is this? There's 100% certainty of impact. Please, don't say 100%. Can we just call it a potentially significant event? We watch as they desperately try to inform the public to no avail. Throughout the film, Dr. Mindy flips sides and is used to legitimize the corporation's idiotic plan to get rich off the asteroid. Right now, millions of you are having these same doubts and questions about the approaching comet. That is why Bass Cellular, in conjunction with the United States government, is creating a new hotline, free of charge, 
to answer all of your questions. He, once an ally, is now filled with nothing but the will of capital. He's been consumed by the flood. I quite like this aspect of the film as it shows the fragility of this stance as an access for climate change advocacy. It also inadvertently highlights the fundamental issue that even if everyone in the world were to look up, they'd still be utterly powerless to force the governments of the world to stop the asteroid. Herbert discusses how using existing forms of organized labor, unions in the energy sector to disrupt the market and bring about much needed shifts away from unsustainable energy is a realistic way to address the climate crisis. I find this, while still difficult, a very practical approach that addresses the fundamental issue we face today, a lack of any real democratic power. What Fisher called reflexive impotence, a worldview he described as common among young British students but can be expanded to include the feelings of the working class, is summed up as they know things are bad and they know they can't do anything about it. Fisher deemed this a self-fulfilling prophecy. Reflexive impotence is not so much a self-fulfilling prophecy as it is a reflection of our current predicament. As Herbert illustrates, business groups and the world's economic elite have the most impact on state policy. Also, the majority of people don't own the means of production and are dependent on the privately owned market to gain their living. Herbert states, the lack of control over material production itself is what leads to the specific experience of powerlessness over the ecological crisis today. Not only do the majority of people lack meaningful control in their workplace, but also over the very media they consume as Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman described in Manufacturing Consent, where news is biased toward the global elite through specific filters, effectively creating the propaganda model. The five filters being one, ownership, two, advertising, three, the media elite, four, flack, and five, the common enemy. A common enemy, a boogeyman to fear, helps corral public opinion. Again, art horror is a necessary part to manufacturing consent. I'm not calling the media fake news only biased. While the majority of the working class today are not conscious of the root cause of this reflexive impotence, and it is necessary to break through capitalist realism to illustrate it, capitalist realism is very much supported by the markets, by the material conditions which the working class sustain themselves. It's why organizing labor is crucial. To know you are forced to engage in an inherently exploitative system doesn't change the fact you are in an inherently exploitative system. Don't look up confirms. Knowing the problem isn't actually addressing the problem. Looking up in and of itself isn't radical. The turn of phrase in the title, Don't Look Up, meant to encapsulate the level to which humanity will avoid reality. All that needs to be done to confirm the current climate crisis is to look it up, opens Don't Look Up to further criticism. What is to be done after looking up? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm looking at it right now too, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's horrific and it's, and it's beautiful at the same time. This is the question the film never meaningfully answers. Looking up to the stars morphs into more of a wasteful luxury than anything else. Jordan Peele's nope, while about something completely unrelated, seems to be the perfect answer to the outrage and don't look up, inspired by those who refuse to just look up. I'll keep this brief, I don't want to spoil this film, even though a good film can't really be spoiled even if you know the ending. <laughs> That's my, uh, that's probably gonna be my one hot take for this video. Here, Jupe, the successful entrepreneur, is profiting from the very action of looking up. And ultimately this, what in Don't Look Up seems to be a radical thing to do, is not only a form of passivity, but leads to avoidable death. Yes, looking up was necessary in identifying the problem, but the effective response becomes an intentional avoidance while actively combating the problem. Putting your head down and getting to work, so to speak. Here, Nope clearly shows that looking up runs the risk of turning the problem into a spectacle, and that the most beautiful sights will blind you before they strike, which is what we see happen in Don't Look Up. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm looking at it right now too, it's unbelievable, it's, it's, it's horrific and it's, and it's beautiful at the same time. Looking up here was unfortunately always portrayed as not only meaningless, but harmful. It ruined the lives of our protagonist before Dibioski landed. I was questioning why would I ever look up if you were only meant to be miserable in the truth. Unfortunately, Don't Look Up doesn't escape the trap of capitalist realism and any revolutionary element of the film is lost, replaced with some absurd, dare I say, welcoming of the supposedly unavoidable climate doom. Don't Look Up, if meant to spur climate action from the masses, comes across as a failure. Imagine on a sinking boat, I put on the Titanic instead of the tutorial unloading the plentiful lifeboats. 
this is quite frustrating because the film is clever, even in the way it combines an imaginary Hilly with an imaginary Trump as a subtle critique of both political parties. And yet it provides no alternative to the end of the world, no reasonable path forward, just a story where failure was inevitable. Even an obvious political satire supports the system it's trying to critique, quickly consumed by the flood. What is central in Don't Look Up is a horror in knowledge. Mindy and DiBiaschi live out their final days knowing everything they love will perish. This is what draws me to Lovecraft's work. It's not the fear of knowledge or fear inspired by the lack of knowledge, but the fear brought on by the uncovering of the always present, unavoidable truth of your predicament. The more that's pulled, the more that unravels, the more desperate it feels. Lovecraft developed a strong sense of isolating sanity in a world where every one ounce is living in a unified bliss of ignorance. It is the horror that is unavoidable. No matter if you deny its existence, it is still coming. This comedy managed to capture the cosmic nihilism of Lovecraft better than the majority of the straight adaptations. Lovecraft said himself, the world is indeed comic, but the joke is on mankind. Lovecraft's Color Out of Space, a story where a meteorite lands in some rural farmer's yard and begins to seep a color into the trees, the soil, and the well the family drinks from, leaves the reader with an eerie sense of dread. It's a slow yet nail-biting story as the color changes everything exposed to its alien shade. The family, the gardeners, are tied to the land and can't grow edible crops, their livestock dies or runs away, they are unable to sell the land for more prosperous pastures if they even had the desire to. As they drown in the color, they lose themselves as one by one their sanity either escapes them or they're lost to the glow. This is different from the shadow over Innsmouth, partly as you know the ending as soon as you begin their tale, and yet the most terrifying part is the fact it's still spreading. Slowly the color is inching its way through the town and consuming everything in its path. While not as dramatic as Don't Look Up's Asteroid DiBiaschi, it spells the same ending. Though there is no moment of collective recognition or a chance to choose your final moments, just a subtle devouring of everything. This is a very defeatist, pessimistic view of the world, and it's this that underpins capitalist realism. It's a strange comfort I feel in stories like this, like an absurd embrace of hopelessness. I've come to see capitalist realism as pervasive not only because of our material conditions, but also because of its comfort. It's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism it is quite literal. To confront capitalist realism internally is a violent process, as tearing down a fantasy always is. In this view, both art horror and cosmic horror would seem to be ineffective approaches to the horror genre if your goal is to challenge the status quo. But this misses the radical potency hidden in both of these subgenres. Here, the fly is quite remarkable. Veronica, our emotional signifier, humanizes Brundlefly until he is no longer recognizably human. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Seth. You look so pretty. Uh, what happened? She is art horrified by his presence, yet she still cares for him. This intentional confrontation with art horror is necessary to overcome it. The true horror of the fly isn't even the humanoid man fly, but Veronica's unwanted pregnancy, a pregnancy fathered by Brundlefly. The fact she might be carrying Brundlefly Jr. fills her mind with horrible premonitions of a demonic, miraculous birth. The film shows her controlling X, who was somewhat of an antagonist early in the film, is necessary for her to acquire an abortion. Brundlefly then kidnaps her from the hospital before she can go through with her abortion, robbing her of any of the limited autonomy that was provided to her. The true horror of the fly is natural. The art horror is an entertaining element that draws in the audience, while the movie delves deeper into issues underpinning society. Even cosmic horror can effectively portray a hopeful message, as is the case in Frank Darabont's The Mist, where a group of shoppers find themselves trapped together in a grocery store as the world is engulfed in a dense, isolating mist. The shoppers, forced into a paralyzing stasis, are confronted with a choice when a nameless mother stands out from the crowd. I'm trying to figure out what happened. I'm sorry. I, I can't just stay here. I have to get home to my kids. Of course, who would accompany her on this suicide mission? Alone, she neglects her safety and steps into the mist. As the cosmic monsters hidden in the mist reveal themselves, it's fair to assume she never makes it home and our survivor's grip on rationality loosens as one by one, they watch one another die. There's nothing out there. Nothing in the mist. What if you're wrong? Then I guess 
joke would be on me. After all. This line for me is notable. This tells us the nature of the events to come and the entire purpose of this film. The Mist is playing a cruel, practical joke, and this moment is nothing more than a red herring, a bluff, disguising who the joke is really on. The film makes no attempt at hiding its real terror, foreshadowing the spread of religious fanaticism as the survivors now divided express that their fear of their neighbors is greater than the monsters in the Mist. She's preaching to him right now. By noon she'll have four more. By tomorrow night, when those things come back, She'll have a congregation and then we can start worrying about who she's gonna sacrifice to make it all better. Our main protagonist, David Drayton, and his group rationalizes just human nature to justify terror while afraid. Eventually, the film seemingly confirms this as the emerging cult begins to sacrifice people to the monster. This echoes themes similar to William Golding's Lord of the Flies, where, you know, boys stranded on an island start killing each other out of sadistic enjoyment. This would be an improper reading of The Mist. In Lord of the Flies, Golding tells a story of how evil is an innate characteristic of humanity, represented in the deserted boys who once left to their own devices without any authority, a proper hierarchy, quickly commit acts of cruel, meaningless violence for the sake of simple enjoyment. The Lord of the Flies is unashamedly pro-hierarchy, the systems of power, and so on. You know, law and order. The Mist is, and I know this is controversial, quite the opposite. The cause for the entire conflict is laid at the feet of the military. The blind faith, the passive acceptance the town had toward the government is thrown directly in their face through cosmic horrors and the bodies of their neighbors. It was their trust in law and order, the status quo, the hegemonic state that the film is assaulting. When faced with the impossible art horrors of cosmic nihilism, the film also shows how quickly religious ideology can emerge as a comforting explanation and what horrors will be permitted in the desire for safety. This is not human nature, but the nature of ideology. It shields itself from interpretation, quietly camouflaging itself as part of the natural order, as is the case with capitalist realism. It's much clearer in the book, but this town was already susceptible to religious fanaticism before the seams of existence literally tore open. It's not till the last five minutes of the film that it cements itself as truly revolutionary. Unfortunately, Stephen King has sentenced anyone who spoils the last five minutes to uh, hang from the neck until they're dead, so... Uh, Let's wrap this up, folks. Let's wrap this up. Okay, he's probably gone. I will proceed to spoil the film. Fair warning, it's quite disturbing. Trigger warnings for mental health and suicide. David, along with four other survivors, including his son Jack, were forced to traverse the mist as the fanatics were planning on sacrificing them one by one, presumably, till the mist lifted. Filled with tentative hope, they drive and drive through nothing but mist and destruction until they can't drive anymore. With the tank now empty, they access their options, go on foot or bite the bullet. Well, we gave it a good shot. At this point in the film, all hope is lost. It's an easy choice, except they're a bullet short. Four bullets. There's five. David, the unelected leader, freely gives up his chance at a quick and painless death. We watch in horrible misery as he sobs uncontrollably, exits the car, and demands death, when suddenly the mist clears. If I'm being honest, as soon as the mist cleared, I laughed in uncontrollable horror. Oh my god, this was the funniest thing I've seen all 2022, and at the same time, the most depressing. The unnamed mother even glances defiantly from the comfort of the heavily protected truck holding her children alive and well. The film rewarded her selfless devotion to those she loved and her suicidal hope in the face of danger. The film was in all of its cosmic horror playing a joke on the audience through David. The message is clear. Even when all hope is lost, you mustn't give up hope because all it might take is a minute for the mist to clear. This moment of cruel comedy managed to capture the cosmic nihilism of Lovecraft better than the majority of straight adaptations, while simultaneously defying it. I do consider The Mist a radical film today because hope is a necessity to any social movement. No story depicts the importance of hope quite like George Lucas's A New Hope, the film which gave birth to the Star Wars universe. Lucas has been open about the political significance of this film, a group of rebels fighting for their independence against a hegemonic, intergalactic superpower with weapons of mass destruction, it's its hard to miss, quite frankly. What's central in the film is the Rebels' last hope, the plans to the Death Star, the Empire's planet killer. 
When stories talk about hope, it often reads as vapid. James Mateague's V for Vendetta comes to mind, where the way to overcome fascism is to put on a mask, join hands, and watch a building burn. No one will ever forget that night and what it meant for this country. Lucas's film, however, bases this hope in objective information, not just in the hearts and spirits of the rebels. There are many plans on how to swiftly transition to clean energy and begin the decarbonization science says is necessary to confront the climate crisis. It's not the most riveting topic for a YouTube video, but I personally found Herber's path forward compelling, fixing our attention on unions, specifically in the electricity sector, as it's already one of the most unionized sectors in the United States. And electrical workers possess literal power over the economy as a whole. Unions are a great tool in providing information to workers and consumers alike on why workers leading the transition to green energy is in their best interest. As green capitalism, private, ununionized capital is dominating that scene currently. Again, accurate information is everything. They who have put out the people's eyes reproach them for their blindness. A John Milton quote that this tragic and admittedly humorous ending to the mist screams into my brain. No one can blame David for jumping the gun here. He was effectively blind. That's what makes this joke so tragic. With the limited information available to him, he made a noble choice. Today, it appears we have the opposite problem, too much information, but it creates a similar uncertainty, the same hopeless mist. The media is privatized and an algorithm decides what and who we see, but now we can make and distribute information to an audience of potentially millions of people. Channels like Not Just Bikes and Climate Town specifically give me hope as well. Like, wow, other people find stuff like urban planning and electric stoves genuinely interesting and extremely important. I mean, that's that's awesome. Even recently, seeing workers in the UK strike in solidarity with one another made me genuinely hopeful. And of course, Christian Smalls and the push to unionize Amazon is great too. I tend to be a bit of a pessimist and think it's always important to strive for more. As Franz Fanon said, the colonized subject is at constant risk of being disarmed by any sort of concession. And I do believe complacency is in part responsible for the mess we're in today. Uh, I also recognize killing hope isn't radical either. If all we can imagine is the end of the world, why would we look up? Thanks again to Atlas VPN. Make sure to check out that link below for a great deal on internet security. Wow, you actually finished my video. That is still something that blows my mind and you're still watching me talk. So thank you so much. You don't know how much I appreciate it. And it still like truly blows me away. I didn't actually think I'd ever get people who actually watched my videos and enjoyed talk hearing me out. I, I think it's really awesome. Thank you. Thank you to my awesome patrons. I this this is crazy. I never thought I'd actually have like one of these endings where I have like people who support me scrolling next to me. Like it's just so awesome. Like thank you guys really made this possible. One thing that I'll say that I wish I made clear in the video, climate politics rooted in science is what got me interested in climate change. And I think it's really important, but I also think it's just super important to have a diversity of tactics. So like if it's, if, if it's not your cup of tea, well, here's another reason to care about it. And I think in a situation where we can find so many ways to care about climate change for everyone, I think why not just diversify our approach so we can try to appeal to everybody, reach out across the aisle to anyone and everyone, because I think it is just such an important issue. And it's one that I want to try to talk more about. I really want to try posting more regularly. Um, of course, they won't be all to this magnitude, but I think that's okay. I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, and it's so interesting because on the left, we ask you to comprehend and to grapple with these massive systemic issues and these ginormous systems that just feel... Um, feel like a Lovecraftian monster, honestly. They feel like an eldritch horror that you can't really even begin to meaningfully fight. And then and then we ask you to look at that and then say, well, anyway, here are the nuts and bolts and the screwdriver so you can try to piece your way out and try to change the system any way that you can, right? And I think that's something that I'm really trying, that's something that I've like had to grapple with myself is like, you know, even if it feels pointless it's like so important like the nuts and the bolts like like we should be canvassing yes please vote everyone when you have a chance if you have the ability please vote i'll probably be looking for more 
pragmatic videos in the future and more pragmatic ways to actually get everyone involved. Sometimes you have to work within the system, really. And I think that's where I see my channel heading. Anyway, I don't know why I went on this rant. But anyway, thank you so much again for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe. Comment down below your thoughts. I'm sure you probably have many if you made it this far. Um, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Uh, my patrons are the only reason I'm able to make stuff like this happen. And also, like, thank you to Atlas VPN. Super cool you guys are sponsoring this video. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for a VPN, check them out, dude. They're pretty awesome.